Charleston County Coroner's Office has seen a lot of drug-related deaths and a lot of traffic accident deaths. Today, I talk one-on-one -on -one with Charleston County Coroner Bobby Joe O'Neill for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Charleston County Coroner Bobby Joe O'Neill, welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups. Hi, Quentin. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Obviously, you've been the coroner now for a year. So what's going on right now at the Charleston County uh, uh, Coroner's Office, that is? Well, as um, as I mentioned a little bit ago, what's not new is our numbers. I mean, our numbers are still high in sort of all areas. Um, but we've got a few things that we're doing to try to impact that from an investigative standpoint and then to be able to provide information back to the community. What information are you providing back to the community right now with those numbers? Yeah. Well, the big issue we're seeing is our continued drug overdoses. You know, opioid and fentanyl continues to ravage our community and lots of communities. And so one of the things we brought in is what's called a Randox, and it is an, a, a point of care toxicology analyzer. So normally we would send off a toxicology sample and not get it back for three, four, five weeks. And so now we're able to get back an immediate result. It doesn't tell us the value, how much of the drug, but it tells us whether it's positive or negative. And that's really important is we sort of triage and provide information to the community. So we uh, can take that real-time information, give it to law enforcement, DAOTAS, those who are providing treatment as to what drugs we're seeing, especially if we see pop-ups in certain communities. Um, the other thing we can do with that data is immediately put it into ODMAP, which is the tracking system that tracks where we see drug overdoses, whether they're fatal or not, and again, in real-time data. So we're it used to be, you know, it would be many, many weeks before we could share that information now we're able to give some real-time uh, information uh you know within a day or so after that death occurs so which ones are fatal and which ones are actually non-fatal right now well uh, the the big drug we're seeing is fentanyl um so uh, most of our drugs have uh, or deaths that are related to drugs have fentanyl in them but we're seeing quite the mix so we're seeing fentanyl mixed with benzodiazepines, mixed with xylazine, which is um, uh, sort of street drugs, and they're not prescribed. Um, we're seeing quite the mixture of things. And it's a pretty dangerous time out there, um, you know, and sometimes we have individuals that uh, may take a, a pill from a friend, you know, because they were out of theirs. And if, it, if they're not sure that where it came from, they probably shouldn't be taking it. It could very well be laced. So uh, how many of those drugs are actually laced that you all have seen with your results? Well, we're seeing fentanyl in a lot of things. Now, whether or not it's known, that, whether it's not known to the person who took it that it's got fentanyl in it or it's not known to them, that's not something that we're probably ever going to actually know. Um, and then we have to have a, a sample of the drug itself to be able to test it. And sometimes law enforcement is able to get that and sometimes we're not. So it's kind of a hard answer to question to answer. Um, we just know that we're seeing uh, fentanyl, methamphetamine, benzodiazepines, and others all mixed together. Uh, it used to be back in the day when I first started in the coroner's office, we would see a drug overdose with one drug. It was cocaine or it was heroin or w whatever. And now we are seeing mixes. There's lots and lots of mixes of drugs together. Jesus Christ. So, okay, where exactly are the pop-ups when it comes to fentanyl here in Charleston County? Where it's, you know, it's all over the county. I think there's more sort of some um, thoughts that maybe certain communities are, are hitting it more than others. And that's just actually not the case. I mean, we are seeing it um, all the way as far, far uh, uh, north as McCollumville, down south to Johns Island and Hollywood and in North Charleston. So this isn't a one neighborhood issue. This is a, com a full community issue. We're seeing it and all the uh, geographic areas and all ages. I mean, we're seeing it in our young folks, but we're also seeing it in our older folks. So I, it's, it's not a specific target group that's being impacted. So you talk about the impact. So let me ask you this, Bobby Joe. When it comes to that, <laughs> where is the help? Where is the educational uh, aspect to this to stop people from using these things? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is to provide information just about the numbers and getting that real time data and what we're actually seeing and where it's at. Um, and the, you know, most the other thing recently we did in the coroner's office is we're now a distributor of Narcan. So we've gotten set up that we not only is all of our folks trained on how to use it. And sometimes people ask, well, why does the coroner need to know how to use Narcan? It's like, well, we go to scenes where um, there are family members who may be impaired. There may be bystanders or friends who are impaired. And, you know, once we get there, EMS and fire leaves. 
and they leave with the Narcan. <laughs> so to be present and, and make sure that we're able to provide that information, you know, that if we need to is good. The other thing is that to be able to provide education to those who are there, making sure they have Narcan available to them, whether we give it to them or they get it from somewhere else. Uh, but our office is open. We um, have Narcan available. If someone knows that they've got someone in their family that's um, impaired and they're worried about, stop by. We'll give you a pack of Narcan, no questions asked. So how many people have you all helped that has been actually impaired? Uh, well, I haven't had to administer ourselves at all, thank goodness. Oh, good. um, but that, that's sort of the, the goal is we don't want to be, we don't want to have to use it. Right. But I can tell you, we don't want to be somewhere and wish we had it. So it's important that we're carrying it. And I would say that to the public too. You know, if they're, um, you know, paying attention, have, a, have it in your purse, even if you're not the user or your family's not the user. It's not to say you're going to encounter somebody on the street or in Walmart or <laughs> wherever it might be. Um, you're better to have it than to wish you had. Exactly right. And so when you look at those numbers, Bobby Joe, where are these numbers from 2022 to right now? Well, so I, I got them ready for you. So, um, and actually in 2020, we had 180 drug overdoses. In 2021, we went up to 183. Last year, we were at 20, 240, <clears throat> 240, excuse me. Right now, we are 35 that we know are positive, and we're going. We've called it that. We have 47 that are still pending the the full toxicology panel. That puts us at 82. If those that were suspicious, which is pretty bad considering we're only one quarter into the year, right. um, so we're not on a good trajectory here on on the number of drug overdoses that we might encounter here in Charleston County. So, how many of those are negative? Uh, how many are negative for drugs? Yes, you mean? ma'am. Well. Well, we have, that's all I, you know, I wasn't prepared for that question, uh, Quentin. You know, um, the, these here are the ones that we know that that drug is fatal, where the, the drug caused the death. Now, we see lots and lots of deaths where they may be positive for a drug, but we are not attributing their cause of death to that drug itself. So do we have a lot of people who are positive, but it's not actually the cause of their death? Yes. Um, and then do we see a lot of people that are negative? We do. But unfortunately, these drug overdoses are, are rising. So where do you see this? And I hate to ask this question, but where do you see yeah. these numbers heading at, especially now that we're approaching summer? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty afraid that it's, we're going to beat last year's numbers. Um, you know, unfortunately, we've got a very uh, chemically addicted society and they're using it as a coping mechanism. It's very rampantly available. Uh, they're mixed with things that they may not realize they're mixed with. And it's just a dangerous time, you know, and I, I hope that everyone hears that, that even for the the user of marijuana, which, you know, a lot of people don't believe is a problem and I don't have an opinion one way or the other, but it could be laced with fentanyl. That's where it becomes the problem. And so um, another thing folks can do is there are fentanyl test strips that they can get that comes in the Narcan kits that we have that if they've got something and they wonder, they can test it themselves to see if it tests positive for fentanyl. Um, that is the deadly drug right now is fentanyl. And, and, and so besides that, you, your office is obviously busy with so many other issues, obviously homicides, suicides, accidents, unknown causes. So besides fentanyl and those other drugs, which one was the biggest for your office in 2022? Oh, um, well, we had a lot of suicides. Uh, again, I'm going to sort of go back to my numbers, although we're a little down from uh, 2021. So our suicides in 2020 were 65. We saw a jump up to 75 in 2021. We were 67 in 2022, but right now we're at 19. So again, for the quarter, we're sort of uh, ahead of where we would like to be. And then we're seeing a lot of traffic fatalities. We've had 16 so far this year. Um, almost half of those are auto pedestrian accidents. Um, but I think the other thing is those are all over the county as well. So we're not seeing in one specific area of town. Um, it's all over. What we are seeing, though, is the the times that they are impaired driving. So when we look at the those who died um, in a car accident where they are the ones who are at fault of the accident, they almost always are impaired. And they're not just a little bit impaired, they're a lot impaired. So just to make sure everybody understands what that means, so the legal right. limit to drive a car, you have to be under 80 or, or 0.8. And what we're seeing is 
of these individuals who are impaired, they are more than twice the legal limit is and that which would put it at 160 or 0.16 or 1.6 all the way up to 300. So that means they're four times the legal limit to be driving a vehicle. That's pretty um that's that's pretty unfortunate when we have a lot of information out there about impaired driving and drunk driving. Um, what's also interesting is those individuals who died in a car accident who were not the at-fault driver, they very rarely have, they're not impaired at all. So uh, so that's sort of interesting, that um, interesting data. Even our auto pedestrian, although they are the pedestrian, many times they are also impaired. And so there is um, a lot of work to be done on, uh, just the risks of too much alcohol. And unfortunately, you know, I, I want to ask you this question too, but in those auto pedestrian accidents, uh, Bobby Joe, which, which one of those people have actually been at fault and which ones have actually been not been at fault? It's about half and half. So about half of those individuals are the at-fault driver, um, whether they ran a red light or whatever it is. There's a variety of things. Um, and some of those have gotten struck by that person who ran the light or whatever the circumstance was. So about half and half, um, which is um, pretty scary for those of us on the road. Yes, 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 indeed. You talk about obviously all of these things happening around the country. So when you look at the population right now, what was the last figures for population in Charleston County? I think we're now about 430,000, I think is kind of the last, what I've seen. And that doesn't include all of our tourists, <laughs> you know, during, uh, during certain times of years, we double, you know, because of Spoleto and all of those things. Uh, but I think uh, about 430,000 is the estimate right now. And uh, I ask many people, there's a lot on point this close ups and they're like, no, 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 we're not losing. We're not losing. But how many residents have actually have Charleston County actually lost in the past year? Oh, boy, I don't have any idea. It seems like everybody's moving here. Or do you mean? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah. <laughs> I think they're all coming here because it's so wonderful. You so know, wonderful. we need to stop this wonderful campaign about how great it is. Because you know? <laughs> it is a great place to live. It, it is. It really is. <laughs> yes. So, so let me ask you this. What is the pace of growth right now in Charleston County? Say that again. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Sorry about the wind out here. But what is the pace of growth in Charleston County right now? Oh, I think it's off the charts. I mean, you know, I can, you know, just tell you that as our numbers just increase, just because of population, um, you know, you see the buildings going up all over town and all over the county, and it's not just even one area. I mean, it used to be that it was Mount Pleasant that was booming, and then it was Johns Island is booming, and um, it, it's booming everywhere. And that impacts the response of all first responders and those who respond, uh, just because our numbers are up. Speaking of enough up that is, what deaths were actually caused by homicide in 2022? In 2022? Well, in 2022, we had 56 homicides in 2022. Um, the year before, we were at 67, so we were a little low. Um, now, right now, I'm sort of happy to report we've, we've I don't want to say the word only, but we've had 10, um, which is, I think we had one additional this weekend that may not be in that count. I ran these numbers a couple of days ago, but um, so we, if we stay on that same trajectory, it could be that our homicides are actually down this year. Um, that would be um, a wonderful thing. Yes. And speaking of trajectory, Bobby Joe, where are those numbers versus pre-pandemic? Oh, for homicides? Yes, ma'am. Well, I, for what I've got in front of me for you is 2020, you had 65. And we kind of maintained that number, I mean, for a couple of years. And then we had a big jump in 2021. We were at 75 in 2021. So last year, we dropped a little bit to 67. And then, as I said, right now, we're at 10 for 2023. Um, wow. And speaking of, uh, obviously, COVID, what were those numbers of pandemic corner case responses in 2022? For COVID only? Yes, ma'am. Well, so for COVID, we didn't have a whole lot of, uh, of cases that related just specifically to COVID in 2022. Okay. What we were seeing, though, is um, deaths from individuals who either had COVID in the past um, or we were concerned about response to medications or vaccines. And some of that's hard to research. But we have, you know, I'll tell you, um, the past year or so, we've seen more deaths of young children than I've seen in a long time. Um, some of those we're having a hard time explaining. Um, don't know if it's because they had a COVID um, 
uh, exposure and it wasn't recognized. Uh, I don't, some of those are complicated. Um, are they related to COVID? I don't know. We keep reporting them to agencies that sort of research that. Uh, but we've seen an awful high number of children in the past year and a half. And what else are you reporting to those agencies in regards to the COVID cases? Well, if we have someone who's gotten any type of vaccine, whether it's COVID vaccine or measles vaccine or, or any type of vaccine, there's actually a vaccine adverse reporting system. So we'll report information that we have a death that's maybe in close proximity to them receiving some sort of vaccine for them to be able to research that and see if there's any correlation. And then all of our children deaths, are uh, a couple of things happen. One, we do child death reviews on all of those. Those get reported to the state child fatality team that are also reviewed again. And then data from that is inputted into the national center database, which also compiles information, not just from the state, but from nationally. So we're, we're trying to provide all that information as best we can to get, you know, as clear numbers as possible on what's happening to our children, our community. So when you've gotten that data back, what numbers are looking right now to you as far as correlations with these deaths and cases? Well, unfortunately, most of the time what we see with young ones is really unsafe sleep setting. And, you know, where we've got co-sleeping, whether it's in adult beds or on couches, and um, sometimes even in cribs and bassinets, we'll, we'll see adult-sized pillows in those sleep settings. And, you know, mommies and daddies are trying to make a comfy spot. I mean, they're not trying to do anything wrong. Unfortunately, they just understand the risk factor associated because little ones can't raise their head or roll over and can't get themselves out of a bad position. So that's what we see most of the time with children's deaths is unsafe sleep setting. But sometimes we have one that's in a good spot. They're sleeping fine. Um, we don't see any risk factor in that regard. And then we're having to do other tests to see if they have some sort of genetic ab abnormality, whether they have pneumonia or there's something about the their physical state that's maybe caused their death. But unfortunately, a lot of it is unsafe sleep setting. And then think, let's think about those high TVs right near those cribs and everything too. Yeah. Yes. Mm. So sad. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of obviously deaths, when you look at the cases, how many backward cases were there last year? How many backlog? Yes, ma'am. Um, well, I think anytime we have a real complicated case, it take they take longer. And so I'm not sure I would call them backlog necessarily. It's just unfortunately testing takes a long time to come in. Um, and so we'll consider them backlogged if we're waiting on results from one year to the next and that we're still you know waiting on those. That's just because toxicology takes quite a while. The only other thing I would say we what I would consider backlogged are those uh, decedents where we don't have them identified. Right. And unfortunately, we do have some where we've done everything we can do and we put them into national databases, uh, national uh, missing person and identified system where we're trying to identify them, but we don't have uh, everything that we need or we don't have a match. And so I would consider those backlogged because unfortunately we have uh, probably out 20 or so that go back many, many years. I mean, these aren't as of recent of last year, but ones we still would like to give them their name and return them to their family. So how many of those do you want to take care of? Oh, I want to take care of all of them. Right, right. <laughs> um, and one of the things that's helpful right now, um, you know, the new technology is genetic genealogy. Right. And that's really starting to be used. Uh, we actually used it on a case not too long ago. Uh, you may remember the case where we had a foot that washed up on Fort Sumter. And then we had another foot that washed up about a month later. And that was solved. We were able to identify her based on genetic genealogy. So we have a couple of other cases that we've submitted. Uh, they just take time. And unfortunately, they're expensive. Uh, so we do have to kind of pick and choose and sort of which ones do we think we have the, the right sample for. And we really think we might be able to get a hit um, and, and sort of one at a time sort of work through them as best we can. But, you know, my hope would be that sometime this year we're giving someone their name back and can return them to their family. And then we work on the next one. So how many right samples do you have right now? I think we probably have all the cases. We probably have three or four that have pretty good samples that we think we could maybe work with. Um, we have to send them off to labs and they evaluate them and determine whether or not they can uh, get a good screen on them. But then there has to have been somebody on the other end who has also put in their DNA sample to match to. And that's how it works. So individuals who sign up for like Ancestor DNA or other DNA companies where you're trying to learn your family history, there is an option on there to allow your information to be shared with agencies like mine who are trying to compare. And when you do that, then we have something to compare to. But if, if the individuals don't select that, 
no, obviously we can't compare to the DNA samples that are out there. And, and, and a related question, but Bobby Joe, let me ask you this. How many deaths from 2022 were actually returned to the medical professional? What do you, can you repeat that? What do you mean? Yeah. How many deaths were actually uh, re returned to the medical professional? Returned to the medical professional, meaning came to us for cases? Yes, Is that what you're... Like yes, to the coroner's office? Yes, ma'am. Well, so so we handled over about 5,000 cases last year. Um, now, autopsy, we did a, like about 650 autopsies, how, is how many Charleston County did. Um, but there's a lot of cases that we did investigations that maybe didn't warrant an autopsy. So um, we're pretty busy. So we have about six, you know, 5,000 cases coming our way. And um, that's a lot. And we're just only, we're going to grow with the population yes. growing. It's going to grow. And I'm glad you mentioned the autopsy because I wanted to ask you this uh, next question. It might be a difficult one, but are there any partial autopsies conducted? Um, not in a coroner's office. We don't. All of our autopsies are full autopsies because they're considered forensic autopsies. So anytime the coroner is doing an autopsy, we're doing a full autopsy. Now, sometimes partial autopsies are done in, in uh, medical cases in a hospital. Like, you know, let's say somebody has brain cancer and they want to do an autopsy to evaluate that cancer. That could be a partial autopsy. Now, there are some jurisdictions around the country where the medical examiner and coroner's offices are doing partial autopsies due to a shortage of forensic pathologists. Uh, but that's not the case here in Charleston at this point. That's We're doing all full autopsies. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And how many were to, as far as the deaths, how many were there to await the notification of Mexican or the funeral home destination? Well, most of them we find family pretty fast. I mean, so the first thing is we have to identify them, which can and take a little bit of time. Um, if someone doesn't have ID on them, or if we fingerprint them and their prints are not within the, in the system, it could take us a few days to get somebody positively identified. But then we also have to find their family. So we have to have an idea of who they think they are. For the most part, we're finding families within a day or two days uh, at the longest, unless we're having problems with IDing them. Um, most all of those families choose funeral homes occasionally they don't for whatever reason um and then those cases sort of remain with the coroner's office and we have to go through a probate court process in order to have them cremated uh, we try not to do that but unfortunately as circumstances are it, it happens or we can't find next of kin sometimes you know families are estranged um or we do all that we can do and we we can't find them um, if we learn, however, they're a veteran, we work with veterans organizations and have their cremains buried down at the uh, National Cemetery down in Buford. We had a, um, a few buried this, earlier this year, and so we try to do that as best we can. So how many of those cases have you been able to take on, well, had to take on this year, you know, as, as far as, you know, not trying, not finding those people? Um, I, you know, I don't have that exact number in front of me, Quentin, but I would say probably last year we probably had about 20 that I would anticipate that I would, that's just sort of my rough guess here that we either couldn't find family or two, we found family. And for whatever reason, they weren't, wouldn't claim that, that individual. Uh, and that can be for a number of different reasons. Um, sometimes it's financial. Sometimes they've been estranged. Um, you know, they don't want anything to do with that individual for whatever reason. And so we work with them as best we can. And then at some point we go through the probate court system in order to get an order or have them cremated. So let me ask you this. In 2022, the coroner's office was presented with the cremated remains of how many additional persons as unclaimed? Oh, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. I can get that for you. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Uh, any exhumations done last year by chance? I'm Not in Charleston wrong. County. Okay. No, uh -uh. no. We haven't done an exhumation in many, many, many years. Wow. Yeah. So uh, what state of art imaging machine is your office currently using to enhance comprehensive forensic investigations? Well, I'm excited you asked. <laughs> well, so right now we're still using our portable x-ray machine, but I think you might know we got funding for uh, forensic radiology equipment, which is called a CT scan. And so we are um, anxiously awaiting it, um, but we're needing to do some expansion on the building in order to have the right electrical power. So the county's in that process. I think they're probably going to a break ground hopefully here in the next couple months and i'm hopeful by the end of the year the ct scan will be installed and being able to be used so we're in the process we don't have it yet but we're we're getting there getting there and let me turn back over to obviously you know homicides and whatnot because this is associated with homicides but let me talk to you about gun yeah. violence 
So what yep. assures offices outreach plan that has actually produced results thus far? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what's producing results. I know I actually was at a gun violence forum just a couple of days ago. Um, and I think the best thing that coroners can do right now is just provide really accurate information. Um, where, where are we seeing them? What's happening? What's the circumstances surrounding them? And should provide that information education. Um, you know, unfortunately, we, we aren't in a gentler and, and calmer society. Um, and I, I don't see that that's going to get any better. And so what's the question? How do we fix that? I do know there's so many folks in the community that are really uh, doing some great mentorship programs and uh, teaching conflict resolution and a lot of things to sort of teach, you know, how to handle things without a weapon of any kind. Um, but we are in a sad state. There, that, are, that is the truth. And unfortunately, there's an active shooter situation going on right now in Louisville. But let me ask you on a local level, how has the coroner's yeah. office partnered with the emergency management and public safety in support of partnering, uh, preparing for and responding to a complex coordinated terrorist attack? No. Oh, yeah, we're a part of emergency management. So we are a part of the planning process when it comes to any type of fatality or management planning. So whether that's um, how do we all respond? How's our communication systems? And we all are able to communicate on the same channels. Uh, the other thing we've been working on this past year, actually with uh, in conjunction with DHEC, is how to set up a regional family assistance center. And, you know, the, the hope is that we never have to activate it. But the question becomes if we should have a major event in Charleston or anywhere around our region, how do we quickly set up a, a center where families come and get all the resources information that they need? And so that's actually in, in works as we speak. We've been meeting a number of months um, with lots of stakeholders, everything from the hospitals to law enforcement to EMS um, and what all needs to be done and put together to make sure that should we have a major grant, we can respond appropriately. And, and I meant to ask you this earlier, Bobby Joe, but what type of grant has your office received thus far for violent death reporting? So we, um, a couple of things. Um, we actually um, have gotten a number of little grants this year, which is really great. And some of them are specific to toxicology reporting and violent deaths related and what those toxicology levels are. Uh, we also got a little pilot grant for, for reporting uh, child fatalities and, and entering our own data into that national database that I mentioned. So right now, the state uh, DSS actually enters all of that information into the national database, but they're, you know, a year or two behind just because that's that's the way systems work. So we got a pilot project to enter our own and enter them in real time. So we are right now entering all of the 22 data for children and also our 2023 data. And the hopes, once that's all in there, we're going to have the information we need for our community um, as opposed to just the statewide information or the national numbers. What are we actually seeing in Charleston County? So we're looking forward to that program uh, kind of coming to a conclusion and then we're actually applying for a much bigger project to go for five years so what's that bigger project right now on your horizon so this the pilot project that we have is through the cdc foundation and it's the six-month pilot to see how we are able to enter our information into that national database because we have to have a person who manually does that so there's the CDC is coming out with a five-year plan that we can apply for that would incorporate someone to do that for all of our cases and also help with the region. We do the same thing with our opioid deaths, as I think I may have mentioned. We have a regional uh, grant where we're entering information for our neighbors into OD Map. So this would be something very similar where we're entering all that data into the national database system. And then also having one person who specializes in making sure our child death reviews are on time and comprehensive, um, those kinds of things. So we're, we're looking forward to it. We're busy writing. So if we get that award, we'll, we'll share it. Absolutely. And I'll be happy to talk about that as well <laughs> later on. But yeah. let me ask you in generalities, Bobby Joe. What's the toxicology levels right now in Charleston County? Well, for those where we have fatals, they are high. Um, as I mentioned, we're seeing mixes of lots and lots of drugs. So uh, I think, as I mentioned a little bit ago, it used to be that we saw one drug in somebody's system, and that is just no longer the case. We are seeing um, multiple drugs in individual systems, and the substance use disorders that folks have are 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 probably the worst I've ever seen. Um, I, w I wish I could, there was a way to impact that other than trying to do prevention and providing Narcan where needed. 
Yes, ma'am, I understand that. And I failed to ask you this question, but it's related to the grants that you all are getting right now in the mm -hmm. office. But what was the office's approved budget in 2022? I think we're just over $4 million. So, um, and we're bringing in a lot of our own grant money. So it's a good thing that when we can bring in funds that the county does not have to fund, right. so that's a very good thing. Yeah, absolutely. So what were your budget projections for 2022? I think we're up a little bit uh, merely because we're needing an additional person. So, you know, as population increases, so does workload and work demand. Yes. And, you know, the sort of the expectations of what the coroner's office can provide as far as data has gone up. And unfortunately, you need people to be able to do that. Um, so we're fully staffed. I mean, we don't, I mean, we have, we have a little open position because we had somebody who moved, but um, we're probably very fortunate as opposed to a lot of offices where we're fully, we're fully um, uh, staffed, but we will hopefully have a position coming in July 1, just because we're needing additional hands. And, and, and this might be a redundant question, but what were the total expenditures for the office last year? Oh, well, we're spending every dollar that they allot to us. So, <laughs> so you know, um, you know, and that's the thing about, you know, reactive agencies. Ooh. You know, uh, we, we might have a budget for autopsies, for example, but we can't decide on who receives an autopsy based on a budget. I mean, it is based on what the circumstances are, what the national standards are. And so there are some of those that's hard to maintain inside a budget. Same with to toxicology expenses. You know, um, if you have a set budget for how much your toxicology expenses are, it's fine. But what do you do when you hit the limit? Well, you can't not do toxicology testing. So there has to be a little bit of give there. And so we're, we're very, I'm very much appreciative to Charleston County. They understand that. Um, and unfortunately, we have to sometimes, you know, uh, uh, take care of the things that we have to take care of, unfortunately. So what were those toxicology fees for last year? Well, so if we send a toxicology sample off to a lab, a basic test for per case is about $250. Um, now, that's only if we're doing our basic testing. If we are looking for specialty uh, drugs or things that don't come in our basic panel can cost more. Um, if we're looking at additional um, genetic testing or other things, those tests cost more. Also depends on what we're testing. So to test a blood sample is one amount. To test a sample of liver is a different amount. So... And each of those are based on what the circumstances of the situation are. So um, those costs can vary. But for the most part, we're around two two fifty. Do you see those uh, prices, well, those fees actually rising because of the growth? Yeah, well, they're going to rise for a couple of reasons. We're going to rise just because our numbers will rise on the number of times we need to do that. But as we're seeing across the country with everything, prices for everything is going up. So that's going to go up for this too. Um, so we have to sort of be prepared that... Um, you know, although we want to not have to do those, we can't base the decision based on funds. We have to base it based on the circumstances and make sure we speak for that individual and, and tell their story. Charleston County Corner, Bobby Joe O'Neill, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you, Quentin. It's been great talking to you. Likewise.